Welcome to Challenges and Icons, and today I'm talking to Hugh Evans, who's the CEO and co-founder of the Global Poverty Project. Founded in 2008 by Hugh and his partner Simon Moss, the Global Poverty Project is an international education and advocacy organisation working to end extreme poverty by 2030. Since its launch, more than a quarter of a million global citizen supporters have actually joined his project. And following that success, the Global Citizen Festival was founded, which is an annual music festival aimed with a focus of spurring activism rather than actually raising money. Brought up in Melbourne, Hugh was just 14 when he won a World Vision sponsored contest to visit development programs in the Philippines. Moved by his encounters in the slums of Manila, he started his humanitarian and philanthropic vision for change. Prior to founding the Global Poverty Project, Hugh was the leader of the Australian Make Poverty History campaign. And in 2003, he set up the Oak Tree Foundation, an Australian-based non-government organisation that provides aid and development to countries in need. Well, he is an internationally renowned humanitarian and a development advocate. And Hugh was also named one of the most creative people of 2014 by Fast Company. And so it is with very great pleasure that we welcome you to Challenges and Icons to hear about the fantastic success story that the Global Poverty Project is so far. So Hugh, welcome to Challenges and Icons. Thank you very much for giving up your time. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Well, likewise. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, at age 14, after your trip to the Philippines, which has been well documented, you announced that you wanted to dedicate your life to ending world poverty. So let's talk about how did you start on the process of change after that? Well, in the Philippines, I had this epiphany that it was really pure chance that I was born where I was born and the young guy I met, Sonny Boy, was born where he was born. And so coming back from that, you know, I, I didn't feel there was a choice but to try to commit my life to this. And so I said to my mum at the time, I said, Mum, I want to go and live for a year in India. I want to work with Mother Teresa's orphanage and the projects in the slums of Delhi. And, she wasn't excited about that idea. She tried to talk me out of it and eventually, um, <laughs> eventually she let me go. And uh, I remember I, I, so I applied for this scholarship through my school to go and study in the Himalayan mountains of India at a small town called Masuri in Uttar Pradesh and uh, at a school called Woodstock School. And um, I remember I went to the, uh, to the international section of the airport and I said goodbye to my friends and family and I gave them you know, the, the hugs goodbye. I tried to act all brave as a 15 year old kid and went through the international section by myself and jumped on the airplane. And I sat next to this big businessman. He was this complete stranger. I remember I looked him up in the eyes and I completely burst into tears. I was so scared. I, I cried the whole way to India. And, uh, and that year turned my life upside down. It was the year that, um, the year that I saw that two thirds of the world don't live as we live, that two thirds of the world live in poverty and that 1.2 billion people on this planet live on yet less than $1.25 per day. And so I said, I'm going to commit to do everything I can to try to eradicate extreme poverty. But it was also that year that I had a bit of an epiphany. And the epiphany was that, you know, here we were in India. At the time, there were 700 million people who were homeless or slum dwellers. And I came from a country that had at that stage 18 million people. So like more than 30 times our population living in extreme poverty in India, no amount of charity that I could ever raise was going to address this challenge head on. Charity is necessary, but not sufficient. We had to think about the problem entirely differently. And so at that age, I said, I want to try to see what I can do to innovate around this challenge of the end of extreme poverty. At that stage, I didn't really know how it was going to come to fruition. But it was a commitment that I made because I was out of sheer frustration and also out of a question of scale. You know, if, if, you, if you're serious about trying to end extreme poverty, then you have to grapple with the question of scale. And that's what keeps me up every single night. So in a way, you, you, you changed the problem. That's what you were thinking about. You, you thought about the, the, the problem from a different point of view. And that was the, the catalyst for you know, where we are today. And change is, is cited um, on your website. You, you have the, the theory of change, and it's integral to 
the project's campaigning that you do, claiming that significant change to policies or practices will only happen when a critical mass is equipped to take action, which I guess comes back to your scale issue. So can you just tell us a little bit more about how um, the social movement works and how sustainable it is? So uh, to your second point on how sustainable it is, my, um, my premise is that our job is to end extreme poverty and once we've ended extreme poverty, we should be out of business. Mm. So I'm not thinking about sustainability beyond 2030. I'm focused on trying to build a campaign to end extreme poverty by 2030. And so our sustainability as an organization is premised on that, that central notion. But coming back to the, the whole idea, the dichotomy of charity versus say advocacy or, or movement building, I believe that you know charity is important. So if you've got great organizations that are building schools or, or digging wells or providing vaccines, crucial. But the real question there on the advocacy front is how do you raise the necessary resources to enable service delivery to be at scale? It's two sides of the same coin. And so when I look at the challenge of say what we're doing, which is advocacy and movement building, we have to ask ourselves, you know, how do we develop a credible theory of change that can point to the role that the individual global citizen can play in influencing business and government at the highest level. And we start by saying, okay, so there are obstacles to ending extreme poverty. We know them, they're, they're lack of food, lack of education, lack of healthcare, lack of job creation, women's inequality at this stage, which needs to become women's equality. You know, these are the barriers to ending extreme poverty. And what do you need to overcome those barriers? Well, you, in some cases, you need to change policies. In some cases, you need more resources at scale, like say polio eradication, it was a question of a $5.5 billion investment. Mm. Say um, malaria, you need more bed nets. So sometimes it's a question of resources. Sometimes it's policy change. So if you're talking about fair trade and or, or good governance, it's about transparency and that's a policy issue. But all of them involve business, government, and civil society working together. So we've got the mobilization of civil society. That's where our members come in. So we use large scale events to disrupt you know, the social norm. We also use amazing technology to gamify the experience so that users can actually earn points through their experience and actually take action. And we also use compelling content to tell a story of the end of extreme poverty. And we also drive ambitious campaigns that focus on really specific policy objectives at any given time. And our job is a tipping point job. We've got to see how far can we move the needle before we win, because it's binary. You know, if, if I'm trying to see if I can get the Canadian government to increase funding to Global Partnership for Education, then I'll know whether they do it or not, because they, it's up to them, really. And so, you know, our theory of change is really looking at whether we overcome those obstacles. Now we can get amazing outputs. We can get the government of say, uh, like say we get the US government earlier this year to commit $50 million in new funding to education. But then the real outcome is getting those kids into school. Mm. So how do we, and then obviously they have to learn while they're there. So then we work with our partners like the Global Partnership for Education on analyzing their service delivery mechanisms and also on accountability mechanisms to ensure that we can measure the impact down to the child who does or does not go to school as a result of this major government commitment. And that's our theory of change from start to finish. Yeah, which is pretty impressive. And, uh, and, and in amongst that, you, you talked about the way that technology is a kind of a you know, I guess it's a creative tool. So, so, um, and we, you know, a lot of the people I've spoken to are using technology in ways that we can possibly have imagined only like five years ago, uh, let alone 10 years ago. So from your point of view, looking forward with technology, um, can you just give us a personal perspective on the future of technological innovation in changing the world for better? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I look at it both on the side of, of, of ending extreme poverty from a programmatic point of view, but also the side from movement building from our point of view here um, across uh, Australia, New Zealand, the United States and Canada. And looking at it from a prog programmatic point of view, you know, it's amazing to see the delivery of education tools now using smartphones and even modified dumb phones. You know, uh, my wife runs an organization called Library for All and that's their whole mission to deliver 
access to content from the best publishers in the world to people living in extreme poverty who otherwise couldn't afford it. In the area of global health, you see amazing innovations like access to new vaccines that are all technologically driven, but also the way in which those vaccines get to the world's poor um, through GPS services, amazing. Also, you see in the area of agriculture, both new varieties of agricultural products, but also agricultural information to farmers on the uh, production side. And then in the area of, of, of like even digital access, you see amazing initiatives like internet.org championed by Mark Zuckerberg, or you see what Google is trying to do with their amazing balloons in the clouds all across sub-Saharan Africa. Now, obviously they're still years away, but the potential for open data and open communications to be readily available for the bottom billion is imminent. And that's really exciting. I spent the last few weeks with the team at Google and I saw what they're working on and they seem deeply committed to this goal, which was really inspiring. And so, um, you know, on the, on the programmatic side, technology is incredible. On the movement building side, I'm a, b a huge believer in the power of gamification and also innovative content fueled by technology. And I think that what we try to look at, the way we look at globalcitizen.org, which is our, our centerpiece, our, the home of the movement that we're trying to build and evolve, it's really a, a news action site. So people will learn about the issues, they will then take action on it, their actions will earn them points, and those points can be redeemed for experiences. So you're creating a, a whole ecosystem of a movement in that in that technology if we get it right. Now we've still got a long way to go. We're working on Global Citizen 2.0 right now. We hope to be able to launch it in 2015. It's our big project that we've got working on and getting all of the best tech minds that we can around this right now. Um, that's, our, that's our huge ambition for the coming 18 months to make Global Citizen 2.0 off the charts. And we're forming some amazing media partnerships that we're soon to, going to be able to announce of actually how we can link real media that comes from huge media outlets to action taken by global citizens in response to the, the global issues that they're seeing on television. Wow, that's hugely inspirational. I, I can't wait to see the Global Citizens 2.0. And, and talking about that, um, particularly with the festival, you, you're creating this ecosystem, as you described it, this philanthropic culture. Um, but at the same time, uh, we're seeing a lot of other innovative and humanitarian and philanthropic initiatives are launching almost on a daily basis. So a bit like any business, there's like competition out there for the same part of the mind, I guess, you know, in the heart. So how do you feel about increasing competition for social good? Well, my strong view on the fact that there are more players in the social good space is let a thousand flowers bloom. I believe that there are no competitors in the social good space. If it truly is a battle for hearts and minds, then our battle is against those that are, that are not global citizens, like the, uh, I don't want to name names, but, but less, less progressive media outlets that are actually trying to encourage people to be more insular, more myopic, more close-minded. That's really who our competitors are because we're trying to encourage people to be global citizens and say that, you know, you know, it was pure chance that I was born where I was born in the world and, and that, you know, that was the blessing of birth. And as a result, you know, I didn't deserve to be born where I am and therefore I have a responsibility and an opportunity to give back. Mm. And so it's wonderful that more organizations, whether it's amazing partners of ours like Charity Water or Malaria No More or, or Pencils of Promise or UNICEF or the World Bank, they're all out there trying to solve these great challenges. They're all our partners. And we want to work with every single one of them and we want more of them. So long as they're not duplicating one another's efforts, we want more of them. You know, I think that at, truly our competitor are myopic media outlets that are trying to encourage people to be insular, close-minded, fearful. fearful, scared of the world. That's, they're, they're our competitors. Yeah. yeah. That's a great way to think about it, and I think uh, replacing fear with curiosity and uh, optimism is, uh, I think, uh, a very healthy thing to do. So we're looking forward to 2.0. Now, um, 
it's broadly this on the theme of creativity. I mean, what you've done is phenomenal with your ideas and how you translated that to actions, and that's the, the best form of creativity, creativity that makes a change and has a positive impact. And it's no surprising that you've been uh, nominated uh, by Fast Company as one of the most creative people of 2014. So I think I know what the answer to this question is going to be, but, but compared to other attributes towards success, where does creativity rank in amongst those other attributes? I mean, in my view, creativity is central because, because vision is central. See, I've got to, we've got to be able to think, well, not what Global Poverty Project is doing now in 2014, because our, our, our plan for 2014 was already cast at the end of 2013. Yeah. We need to be thinking 2015, 2016, 2017. And to do that, you need creative minds around you. Yeah. So, you know, whether it's our board, our advisors, friends, supporters, our team, or, uh, we look for creativity from wherever it comes within the organization and we try to encourage it, nurture it and respond to it. We, 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 we love good advisors who, who come up with brilliant ideas and are willing to help us solve this challenge of ending extreme poverty by 2030. We need the best creative minds, not just in the creative industry, but in, in science, in engineering, in all of the industries that we're working in and through, we need those creative minds to come together to achieve this great outcome. Mm. Well, I guess the biggest problem will be uh, what to do with when you generate too many ideas. But, uh, <laughs> but that's a nice problem to have, I Focus. guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Follow the vision. So um, let's just kind of uh, come to the end of this, this uh, hugely inspirational uh, talk. Um, regardless of, of the cause, the Global Poverty Project is also a business. Um, so thinking about inspiring entrepreneurs out there um, who may have um, philanthropic ideas um, to uh, generate business concepts and ideas that can make change, what advice would you give to somebody that may be thinking about how can they make a positive change for good? Well, if, if you're at the very beginning, I think it's important to assess what's out there and be really clear on your objective. Um, if there are other organizations that are already trying to achieve the same objective and you can bring a new creative bent to them, then be collaborative. There is, there's too much duplication in the NGO sector and I would encourage more mergers and acquisitions. I know that's not something that usually happens in the nonprofit sector, but I think it should happen far more regularly. And so I would encourage people to be willing to be additive, not duplicative. I think that's really important. The second thing I'd say is be willing to work the hard nights because to start up anything, you have to work and work till, you know, burn the candle at both ends for a very long period of time. It, it's hard to start anything. You need to go through the, we often call it the baptism of fire. You know, you've got to really experience how hard it can be before you can see how good it can be. And I think that's really important. And then, um, and then I think uh, the final piece of advice is it always, starts small and humble and builds from there. It, very rarely you get handed a huge pot of money and you get to start to fulfill all of your dreams about how you can create something that adds value immediately. Mm. Very, most of the times it starts with your friends, it starts with your family, it starts with, with their friends and their family and yeah. you create and you build a team together. And I think that's, that's been a lesson that I've learned all throughout my life that you've got to start with what you've got and, um, and but if, and if you do have a big idea, don't be afraid to follow it, even if people say it's, it's audacious, risky and improbable. Yeah. Go for it with everything that you've got to, to achieve it. I, that's been something that we've found again and again and through, through our experience with the Oak Tree Foundation, through to Make Poverty History, through to now the Global Poverty Project and Global Citizen, we've seen how, you know, it's amazing the way that teams are built over time. And I've been fortunate to have an amazing business partner in Simon Moss, who's been our co-founder, and also Wei Su and Jane Atkinson, our team. They're a really, really strong core team that have held our organization together over a long period of time. And I'm deeply indebted to them for their leadership. Well, um, it's a fantastic story so far. Um, and from the humble beginnings, look what you've created and the momentum you've, you've generated. And it really is, uh, as I've said already, an inspirational story. And we wish you the best of luck for continuing it up, up to 2030, which is where I kind of want to uh, end the questions and just say, um, 
well, if, if you want to sort of design yourself out of doing this by 2030, what do you see yourself doing from 2030 onwards? I'd be overwhelmed with delight to see a world where, where the place you were born, you know, didn't impact the opportunities that you had in life. And I think if we were, li we were living in a world where there was true equity of opportunity so that a kid who was born in rural India can have the same opportunities as a kid who's born in Melbourne, Australia, you know, then I think that's true success and I think that's when we'll be able to celebrate. Um, you know, personally, I, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> I have to joke with my wife, once we've ended extreme poverty, what's the next challenge? And, and uh, we'll save that for later. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure it'll be a success. And uh, I feel like my heart tells me that you're on a, on a road to fulfilling your ambition. And uh, with that, I just want to say thank you very much for uh, your time. I know you're a busy man. And in today's world of kind of, that is kind of seems to be getting crazier by the second, I, I really wish you the best of luck with all your ambitions and, uh, and inspiring other people to achieve what you're setting out to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Cheers.